Hello everyone, my name is Jason Kendall and welcome again to another lecture on introductory astronomy. Today we're going to be talking about the motions of the moon. Now the moon is very, very, very familiar to everyone. Everyone sees it in the sky. It's probably the most familiar astronomical object that we have that everyone knows about other than the sun. So the sun and the moon and ostensibly the stars, are mostly familiar things. But the moon is, of course, imbued with lots of things from literature and culture, and so we can't escape its view. So let's talk about it for a bit. The first thing to understand about the moon is that, well, it orbits the Earth. And as it orbits the Earth, it goes through what we call phases because of the relative position of the moon and the Earth with respect to the sun's light. So the sun shines on both the earth and the moon, the light reflects off of the moon, and what portion of the reflected part that we see becomes the phase of the moon. So always, half of the moon is illuminated by the sun, always. Sometimes we see the entire half that's illuminated, and sometimes we see only a part of it. Most of the time we only see a part of it, and at very special times we see none of it, and that's called new moon. So let's talk about the phases. So the geometry of the position of the Earth and the Moon dictates the phases. It has nothing to do with the shadow of the Earth on the Moon. In fact, that's a really common misconception. It's one of the most common misconceptions of all that the phase of the Moon is caused by the shadow of the Earth on the Moon, and that's simply not true. The shadow of the moon is very large, and when the moon goes into the shadow, we call that a lunar eclipse, but that only happens quite rarely. So let's actually look at what we see in the sky. So the first thing that we see is we call these things phases, and they go through a whole cycle of phases throughout the month as the moon orbits the earth in one month time. It starts off as new, then it goes to a waxing crescent, a first quarter, then a waxing gibbous, then full, then waning gibbous, and and then after that is third quarter, then waning crescent, and then back to new moon. So what are these things and what are their various geometries? Well, a new moon is actually a moon that you can't see, which is kind of a funny thing to think about. But the new moon is the phase of the moon when the moon is in the same direction as the sun in the sky. So if it's roughly in the same direction, you're not going to see the moon in the sky, and so therefore it's called a new moon. It's kind of an odd description, but that's what we call it. We call it a new moon. Anyway, the first time you see the moon is at what we call waxing crescent. A waxing crescent moon rises just after sunrise, and then it sets just after sunset. So a waxing crescent moon is only visible in the early evening, just after sunset. And it's just a portion of the moon that we see. It looks like a croissant, or a crescent, which is where that word in French gets its name, a crescent. So the crescent moon then appears to get larger and larger with time over the course of days, and in a couple of days later, we see what we call a first quarter moon. Now a first quarter moon to some people says, well, it's a half moon. Well, it's not a half moon. We call that a quarter moon because we only see the light from one quarter of the moon. Half of the moon we don't see, which is the far half. The near half, we see that side, but only half of the near half half of the near half is illuminated, so that's one quarter of the moon, so that's why we call it first quarter. It also happens to correspond to when the moon is 90 degrees around its orbit around the Earth, so that is a quarter of the way through its orbit around the Earth, so that's its first quarter, and it's half illuminated. All right, so a half illuminated moon is called first quarter, just to be totally confusing for them for no good reason other than why not. And after the first quarter moon, a few day, days later after the first quarter, it's more than half illuminated. And when the moon is more than half illuminated, we call that a waxing gibbous moon. That's a funny word, gibbous, but it just means more than half illuminated. And as time goes on, we get to a full moon. And a full moon is fully illuminated. After the days after full moon, then we have a waning gibbous moon, which again is more than half illuminated. And then we go through third quarter moon, where it's half illuminated according to how we see it on the Earth. And then it goes to a waning crescent moon, and then back to new moon. So that is the cycle that occurs every 29, every 29 days, and we call that the synodic month. And the synodic month is the month with respect to the phases of the moon. 
So the synodic month traces basically the moon as it goes around the earth from phase to phase. So we have to kind of reference the sun inside of there. And so there's another definition we could use for the moon, and we would call that the sidereal month. The sidereal month is the moon's position in the sky with respect to the background stars. And of course, since the earth is going around the sun, as the moon goes around the earth and the earth goes around the sun, the dip, the, it's a shorter time for it to take to get back to the same place in the sky with respect to the stars than it does with respect to the sun. So the sidereal month is shorter by about two days, and so therefore we get a 20, well, it's roughly 27 days is the sidereal month. Well, most people don't think of the sidereal month, so let's stick with synodic month, which is phase to phase. Now here's how the phases go. So sometimes you see that in paintings or literature or even just common thought, most people really think that the phases, the moon's up all the time. They say, oh wow, let's go outside and see the moon. Let's go see the moon. And they always think of the moon up at night. Everybody always says, let's go out and see the moon at night. Well, sometimes, haven't you noticed that you see the moon during the day? They see it as a gibbous phase during the day. And sometimes you don't see it at night. And you go, well, where's the moon? And you say, well, it's got to be up. It's nighttime. It's the moon. Well, the moon is not always up in the sky at night. So let's, let's look at the various phases. As I alluded to before, the waxing crescent moon rises just after sunrise. So it's up in the sky most of the day, but it's so close to the sun that it actually is overwhelmed by the sunlight. And we can only ever see the waxing crescent moon just after sunset when it's low in the west and its curved portion is facing towards the sun. Now sometimes we think of, there's a, there's a line in Shakespeare, we call it the horned moon or the horned moon. So it looks like a kind of, it's got a pair of horns and that's another way of thinking of a crescent. The horns of the moon when it's in crescent phase point away from the sun. All right, so the crescent moon rises in the morning and sets in the early evening. Now, when does the first quarter moon rise? The first quarter moon rises when it's 90 degrees away from the sun in the sky. That means the sun is at noon, and therefore the, the first quarter moon rises at noon. And so the first quarter moon is high in the sky at sunset, and then it then sets, sets at midnight. So that's kind of neat. That's the arrangement for the first quarter moon. Now gibbous moons are up most of the night and most people think, ah, gibbous moon is a full moon, but it's not a full moon. It's more than half illuminated, but not, it's not full. A gibbous moon rises after, in the afternoon. So it rises at least in the afternoon. So as the sun sets, it's already up in the sky and we see it there and it sets after midnight. That's a gibbous moon. And unless you really like stargazing, unless you like moon gazing, stargazing gets tough in these first, in these gibbous moons because it's up very much most of the night. So we are abandoning stargazing and looking for galaxies and quasars and also and nebulae when the moon's up in a gibbous phase, but we can always go and take out our small telescopes and look at the moon or our binoculars too. All right, so the, when we look at the gibbous moon, it again rises after, uh, well after, uh, it, it rises at well after sunset. It's already been up in the sky. And so as it, it's already been up in the sky as soon as sunset occurs and it sets well after midnight. All right, so let's talk about the full moon. The full moon is different. It rises, since it's exactly opposite the sun in the sky, it rises at sunset and sets at sunrise. So it's up all night. That's the full moon and everybody thinks, ooh, pretty full moon. It's always wonderful to go outside and look at the full moon. It's beautiful and it allows you to see some wonderful things and everybody always has these wonderful superstitions about the full moon and that's to be discussed in a different time. All right, so full moons are beautiful but then we go later and so the waning gibbous moon rises after sunrise. So you get a time in waning gibbous moons when the moon is not in the sky at all during the nighttime. So look at that. So you get the waning gibbous moon. It rises well after sunset and sets well after sunrise. So that's the waning gibbous moon. Third quarter moon rises at midnight and sets at noon. So it's up for half the day. And it's very hard to see it when it's up in the morning, but you can probably catch it if you, if you, if you try in the early morning of a third quarter moon. You can catch it like, wow, the moon's up in the morning. Yeah, that's the third quarter moon. All right. So the best time to do stargazing is usually for the evening people who don't want to get up early in the morning is when it becomes third quarter moon or even first quarter if you want to go late night. But third quarter moon is always people's favorite time for stargazing because, hey, 
All right, after dinner, go stargazing, right? So the crescent, the waning crescent moon then rises very late at night, maybe three o'clock in the morning, well after midnight, and sets well, uh, in it, it sets uh, very far in the day. So it's actually up only a very short period of time at night before sunrise occurs. So it sets, uh, it sets about, if it rises at three o'clock in the morning, it'll set roughly three o'clock in the afternoon. And then shortly thereafter, the moon and the sun will be roughly in the same position in the sky and you get new moon. All right, so those are the phases of the moon and their rough, begin, their rough rising and setting times. Now we did discuss that people sometimes think that the shadow of the moon causes the phases, which is not the case. It's the geometry of the moon and the fact that the moon is spherical and the fact that you own, the sun can only illuminate one half of the moon. Now, since the, these are big things, the moon and the earth are big things, they cast a shadow. And so since they cast a shadow, they can pass into each other's shadow. Now it doesn't happen all the time, so you don't you don't hear about them happening. They sound like more more uh, more exotic events or important events astronomically, and that's because the moon is not orbit does not orbit in the same plane that the Earth goes around the sun. The moon's orbital axis is tilted about five degrees with respect to the ecliptic. The ecliptic again again is the path of the Earth going around the sun. So since they're tilted. The shadow of the moon doesn't always hit the earth, and likewise, the moon doesn't always pass into the shadow of the earth. So these two shadows, or the, one of the objects doesn't necessarily go into the other object, other object's shadow very often. Well, let's talk about the first one, and the first one is what we'll call a lunar eclipse. And a lunar eclipse is when the moon passes into the earth's shadow. So that angle of inclination for the orbits has to be just right, where the intersection of the moon's orbit and the Earth's orbit around the sun has to be just right, and the moon has to be just on that intersection path. And when it is, and it happens to be a full moon, then the moon can go into the shadow of the Earth. And that's what happens, and what we call a lunar eclipse. Sometimes it's a total lunar eclipse, and you see a big chunk taken out of, this, out of the moon as it, as it passes into the Earth's shadow, and then it becomes a deep, deep, deep red from the refracted light of the atmosphere of the Earth and, and landing on the moon, and the moon becomes so dim even a full moon becomes so dim that you can see stars right next to the full moon. It's a gorgeous, gorgeous sight, and if you ever get a chance to see a total lunar eclipse, do so. It's a wonderful sight. Stay up all night if you can. I had the opportunity to actually watch it in the Caribbean on board a cruise ship many years ago. It was wonderful to see. In any event, so the lunar eclipse happens when the, sun, when the Earth, I'm sorry, when the moon passes into the Earth's shadow and a partial lunar eclipse is when it only passes part way into what we call the umbra of the, of the Earth's shadow. The umbra of the Earth's shadow is the total shadow. If it passes only partially, we get a partial eclipse, and it's a penumbral eclipse, meaning it gets partially dimmed because of some of the light gets, passed, uh, gets blocked by the Earth. All right, what happens if it's on the other side and we're near new moon? and all the lines, the intersection of the, of the Earth, of the Earth's orbit around the Sun, the Moon's orbit around the Earth, they all intersect. What happens when they intersect in its new moon? Well then, you can get a total solar eclipse. It just so happens, right now, in the history of Earth, that the distance between the Earth and the Moon makes the Moon have the same exact angular size in the sky as the Sun. The sun's about a half a degree in size, and the, so is the moon. And if you want to check what I mean by half a degree, your thumb held at arm's length is about a degree. You close one eye and you look at your thumb held at arm's length, that's about one degree. Which, if you want to know what that really means, try this. One degree, and then two, and then three, and then four, and you can go 360 times around, 360 thumbs around held at arm's length. And that means your thumb held at arm's length is about one degree. So the moon is about half of that, and so is the sun. They just so happen to be about the same angular size in the sky, which means that the moon can com just completely block out the sun. And when it does that, we call that a total solar eclipse. A total solar eclipse is when you're completely in the shadow of the sun. Now, 
that's a very, very, very small shadow on the surface of the Earth. It tends to only be like tens of miles wide. So when the next one occurs, which will traverse across the United States on August 21st of 2017, then you will see an amazing set of things. Millions of people are going to go try to be in the path of totality as the shadow scoots across, as the moon orbits the, as the, moon orbits the Earth and the Earth orbits the sun. That shadow will move really quickly across the U.S. And if you're inside and down at the bottom of a mine and you can't do that or you're, you can't break yourself away from your cell phone, then you can watch it again on April 4th of 2024. So you'd have to wait a good seven years before you see another total solar eclipse in the United States, but there will be another one. Okay, so a total solar eclipse is when the moon completely covers the sun. And then there's all sorts of wonderful things that you can see when that occurs, such as the sun's corona, you can see the chromosphere, all sorts of beautiful things. And the, uh, as people say that are solar eclipse chasers, it's one of the most gorgeous things that you can actually ever see. A partial solar eclipse is when the moon only partially covers the sun, and we would also call that a penumbral eclipse, meaning we only see it's only partially, uh, partially inside the shadow. So a partial solar eclipse is also very dramatic because it looks like a bite's taken out of the sun and the sunlight dims. In fact, when a total solar eclipse happens, you can see stars in the day and uh, think creatures of the, that normally go to sleep at night, when they think it's nighttime and so they start going to bed, flowers begin to close, roosters crow, all sorts of strange things happen because the animals think, well, it's nighttime, I'll go to bed. So, solar eclipses are an amazing thing and I invite you to go try to see one if one occurs near you. All right, so all of these things occur only because of the geometry and relative inclination of the orbits. That's it. So the phases occur because of the position of the moon with respect to the Earth uh, and the distant, distant, distant sun, and not because of the shadow. The shadow only plays a part in eclipses, and if it's the Earth's shadow on the moon, we call that a lunar eclipse, and if it's the moon's shadow on the Earth, we call that a solar eclipse. And there's two types of, oh, another kind of solar eclipse that occurs, is another weird word for one, it's called an annular eclipse, and an annular eclipse is when the moon is a little bit further away in its orbit than perfectly covering, so it doesn't completely cover the sun, and we, there's a little ring, or annulus, that is around the sun, and so it's a partial solar eclipse, and it's an annular eclipse, meaning an annulus or a ring around the moons, and so you see this wonderful ring, and that's also pretty cool today. That's also wonderful to see. Uh, but I would suggest that if you get a chance, August 21st of 2017, and if this video is still around on April 4th of 2024, go see that as much as you can. It's very important. These are exciting events in astronomical history, and it's something you can tell your kids, grandkids, great-great-grandkids, great-great-great-grandkids, and even write about and blog about, or even just tweet or Instagram or what have you. In any event, all right, so there's a bit about the motion of this moon around the sun and the, the light that reflects off of the moon and its results. See you next time.